right, folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Chris Roeder, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Doing More, Automate Your Stack to Accelerate Value with uh, Pliant and Inspirata. Uh, today, I'm joined by Ves Bakalov, who's founder and CEO of Pliant. Ves has got over 20 years of experience in the tech entrepreneurship space. Um, having previously founded SEV1, uh, Network Performance Monitoring Leader and now part of IBM. I'm also joined by Emil Mladenova, uh, who's the Vice President of Corporate and Digital Marketing at Inspirata. Emil, thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Chris. Emil, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, about what you do and, and about Inspirata as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for inviting me to this webinar. And um, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending, um, uh, joining us for an hour to um, this webinar today. So a little bit about, about myself. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying that um, overall, I, I bring a pretty diverse point of view to business because I've worked and lived in um, six countries across three different continents. So um, that kind of allows me many times to uh, look at things from different angles and and try to apply um, a, a more diverse set of uh, tools or ideas to solving any of the problems that we have. And I've also done a few pivots in my life in terms of career changes, and that also allows me to sometimes wear different hats when I'm solving problems. So that's just a little bit of a background, but in terms of what I do right now, I'm part of the leadership team at uh, Inspirata. Um, we're I'm working very closely with uh, our CEO, CFO, uh, VP of Sales, VP of Engineering, on ensuring that we have uh, world class uh, healthcare technology products, but also that we are growing according to our plans. And I lead all aspects of demand generation. Um, everything related to digital, but also uh, a small team of um, sales development reps, and also anything related to traditional marketing, including the video print uh, materials, collateral, uh, any pr uh, press releases, PR, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in addition, I had some of the competitive intel gathering and market research at the company. Uh, prior to Inspirata, I uh, stood up digital marketing and demand generation, another healthcare company called Doctor First. And before I got into healthcare, I was actually in ed tech, educational, techno educational technology, where I was focused on solving problems related to online learning and uh, using software to, to teach languages. I worked for uh, Rosetta Stone, the pioneer in language learning software. I was part of their market research and uh, strategy team. And I did some projects on uh, identifying the next steps for the corporate strategic roadmap, uh, new industries to go into, but also spent some time in the United Kingdom and Japan uh, to help optimize the company's uh, go-to-market strategies there. And before that, in a different part of my career, uh, very early on after I graduated from school, I was a consultant. I worked uh, with Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I worked for a company called CEB, which got acquired by Gartner um, and that's about it about me. It's a great background. Thank you, Emil. Um, so, you know, you've got a unique background um, for a traditional um, tech session, um, which I actually find interesting as a marketer. Um, and, and your company is unique as well, right? Uh, tell us, if you would, a little bit about Inspirata. Yeah, sure. I mean, without going into too much detail, uh, but Inspirata is a healthcare technology. We are a leader in the oncology informatics space. Uh, we've worked for more than a decade to um, refine our NLP and AI technology, specifically for clinical and cancer data cases. Uh, we've been trusted by the National Cancer Institute, hundreds of hospitals across the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia some uh, registries, uh, cancer registries on the central, you know, state and federal level. Uh, we have four solution areas and they're listed here on the slides. Uh, they may be too clinical for this particular discussion, but very quickly, one of them, digital pathology, 
the product is called Dynamics. It uh, is the only vendor agnostic end-to-end -end digital pathology workflow solution that is also approved by the FDA for use with multiple scanner vendors. Uh, on the cancer registry side, we have a product called ePath Plus, and that helps improve the timeliness, com completeness, and accuracy of the cancer databases that registries collect. We have a solution in the clinical trials area, which is right now very hot. It's called Trial Navigator. Uh, it's uh, ensuring that uh, as patients come in and uh, doctors and clinicians see them uh, at the point of care, they can enroll these patients into the most relevant clinical trials early on, um, and they can do this uh, directly from the workflow that they have in their EHR or EMR. And then obviously, because of all the work we've done on the natural language processing side, we offer our NOP engine um, to uh, clinical researchers to do their own projects and expedite the retrieval of clinical insights from their medical reports. So that's what we do in a nutshell. That's cool. You know, it's funny, I had a, um, a manager a number of years ago uh, who said once as a joke that, you know, listen, don't sweat it. We're not curing cancer here. Um, <laughs> and it made me feel better about the job that we were doing, right? We wanted to do our best, but it wasn't life and death. Um, but at Inspirata, you're really making a difference. And so, um, so that's, that's compelling and interesting. So let's get back to what it is that you do and some of the challenges in just a second. I do want to take a minute and I'm not going to make this a sales pitch. I'm not going to walk through all the details. If you do want more information about Plan or Inspirata, you can visit our websites. But I wanted to call attention to the fact for those of you who are unfamiliar what Plan is, right? Um, we have a core platform that is driven by API integrations, actionable integrations um, built on top of publicly available APIs. We've packaged that up into a custom uh, low code workflow builder. And those things together allow you to automate and orchestrate various functions within your organization. Whether you're in IT, whether you're in marketing, whether you're in other areas of the business and you have repeatable tasks that are leading to toil, to extra work um, that is sort of outside the core strategic work that you need to do to get your job done, Plan can help um, accelerate those, those tasks, can, can help you accelerate through the toil. On top of the platform, we have a number of solutions that are all available uh, to learn more about at plant.io. But I did want to take a moment to call your attention to the fact that we've recently just launched something called Plant Community Edition. Um, so when you think about the platform that I just talked a little bit about, um, Plant Community Edition is a full platform that is made available for free um, and it's hosted in the cloud. Uh, it is available today with access to hundreds of pre-built integrations that you can leverage on day one to build those um, low code workflows that we alluded to in uh, just a moment ago. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look at it. It has all the functionality of the core platform and it is available today. You go on to plant.io, you sign up, registration is seamless. You're in the platform on day one. We have a number of resources available today to help you um, take self-guided tours of the platform, personalized content, and a thriving community where you can know, uh, interact with both client um, technologists, but also other folks who are using um, Plant to automate various um, tasks and processes within their stack. So I encourage you to visit Plant.io today to, to get access to Community Edition to learn more. With that, um, let's let's take the slides down and have a, a conversation. Um, Emil, uh, thanks again for that intro <clears throat> uh, earlier. Um, tell me a little bit about the unique challenges that you face as a marketer um, when you face you know repeatable tasks. Um, you know you're you've, you've got a broad addressable market. You're trying to save the world uh, with Inspirata. And yet there's a lot of systems, there's a lot of processes that aren't integrated. Uh, and, and that led you to, to think about, you know, how can you automate some of these? And tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so a few things that maybe will be interesting to the audience because I realized that everyone has different backgrounds and, uh, you know, just to kind of set the tone for where I'm coming from with my comments here. 
um, just the way things typically work in marketing, at least in marketing in B2B in relatively small uh, companies, uh, small to medium size. So unless you're a very big organization, uh, you typically don't have dedicated dev resources in marketing. You don't have a couple of engineers or developers who are sitting around and waiting for your specific projects uh, and solving those uh, as high priority. Uh, you may wish you have that budget, but it just doesn't work that way. So, uh, and that happens even in a software company. We are a software company. That's what we do. But yeah. our software engineers are focused on our products that we sell, not on the internal projects that I have. Uh, so that's one reality that I have to deal with. And I've had to deal with across the board. It's not just something that's uh, related to where I am right now. Um, the other thing, and that's a little bit of a controversial point, but you know, I hope that any anyone who represents IT in the audience will take it uh, without offense. But IT and marketing sometimes, or oftentimes, have very different approaches to technology, and I'll elaborate on that. So, uh, rightfully so, IT when they think about technology, they try to keep things simple and easy to maintain. So, if you are Microsoft Shop, uh, the natural inclination would be. Uh, try to use something from the Office 365 world. And if you're a Google shop, try to use something that is part of the Google Apps world. Uh, and uh, you know, if it ticks the boxes, then why not? Why not use that particular solution for what your needs are? On the marketing side, we, we try to react to what our customers or the market wants. We also have to deal with the competition. We have to be better than them. We always have to look a little bit more professional than them. We, you know, even if we're a small company, we have to go against the big guys. Yeah. I'm in healthcare. There's some really huge companies that we're competing against. Think about Philips uh, or Hamamatsu or, you know, large companies, international conglomerates. Uh, so, uh, you know, something may tick the boxes on paper that it works, but it's just not what we want to uh, give our target audiences because that's the first impression they're having with us as a company. It may be just too kludgy or not on brand. So marketing prefers to pick whatever is most optimal for the particular task. And even if it has to add to the tech uh, stack, uh, we'll have to do this. It's just part of what we do. So sometimes there's a little bit of clash between the way IT looks at it and marketing looks. And finally, uh, and that's kind of funny, but for one reason or another, once smart marketing starts doing a lot of cool stuff with digital marketing and digital stuff in general, the whole company expects marketing to own pretty much everything that relates to any platform in the sales, sales and marketing uh, realm. And I was shocked to find this out a few years ago when I was more junior and I was doing my first implementation of HubSpot. And I just wanted to have a good marketing automation and CRM. I, that's all I wanted. That's why I was asking for HubSpot. All of a sudden, I got HubSpot, but I also got the additional responsibility to own everything that relates, everything that <laughs> happens in HubSpot. And you know, IT would stay on the on the on the side and be like, "Yeah, we'll we'll support you, but you you own it. This is your baby." Uh, so with time, that accumulates, and as marketing is becoming more and more digital, uh, it kind of uh, comes in with the territory, I guess. It's the right way of looking at it. But we get involved, whether it's me or some of the people that are uh, the more senior members of my team, get involved in leading or strongly contributing to some of the broader uh, business projects that we have. So with that in mind, we have to deal with not only with the actual repeatable tasks that are, that are challenging us, but we yeah. also deal with finding solutions for these tasks. Okay. So your question, Chris, was what are these repeatable tasks? So let me get back to that first because I kind of diverted a little bit. So uh, they all relate in one way or another to data, but I've broken them out in a few categories just to make it more tangible so you can put your uh, finger on, on them and kind of understand what exactly they are. So think about it on the analytics side, marketing mix modeling. Uh, let's say you're running digital ads across uh, different platforms. You have Google Ads, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have LinkedIn, you have some DSP platform, uh, and each platform has its own way of reporting the data. Uh, sometimes even the timestamps are, the date stamps are kind of formatted in a different way. One of the data is exported in hours, the other one is exported in days, another one may be exported in a different day part. Uh, there's just 
all kinds of stuff that comes out in different downloads, uh, CSV files. And a lot of times the API has much richer uh, feeds than the CSV downloads have. So you have to deal with that. But it's uh, repeatable because you know if you want to have optimized marketing spends, you have to do this over and over and over. And it's a tedious chore for you or for someone else on your team to constantly export, collate, clean, and then analyze the data so that you think that you know you have a good picture of how you're spending your money on different advertising and you know up, you're optimizing your marketing spend. So that's that's one area that's I think especially I mean not so much for me because I'm more on the B2C side, but anyone who's in B2C or advertising uh, across different platforms is is facing that, especially the ones that are trying to do their own marketing or mixed modeling or attributions. So the uh, another area is on the reporting side, and that's one of the use cases that I think we're going to cover a little later in more detail. But just so that I'm, you know, while I'm providing a laundry list of challenges, we are on the same page. Think about it: uh, HubSpot or any other CRM that I'm aware of has a ton of useful data, yeah. but unfortunately, these platforms are also not very good at reporting that data back in a format that actually makes sense for an executive or a board board director or a, a board member uh what they want to see uh the the data is there but it's mostly presented in a way that yes if you're a manager and you have the time and this is your day-to-day -day task it's great there's a ton of data but someone who has an attention span of one hour because that's the only time they have to dedicate to this particular thing that's not what they want to see so a head of marketing has to export this on a weekly, maybe monthly, maybe quarterly basis, uh, and format it over and over and over. So that's, again, a repeatable task. Um, another one just kind of relates to synchronizing the different platforms. And I was talking earlier about how we have the tendency in marketing sometimes to add to the MarTech stack or the sales tech, uh, stack uh, yeah. because we just need some point solutions that help us do accomplish certain things. So uh, we're going to dive into this again a little later in more detail. But again, just very high level here. As a marketing executive, it's a fine line you have to tread between getting the best platform that you can find for whatever solution you're looking for, and at the same time, ensuring that that platform communicates with the rest of the, the platforms in your stack, that it plays nicely with them. And sometimes you have to make a trade-off, and sometimes you know, but you're just gonna decide that you're gonna get the best in class, the one that serves your needs the best, and you're gonna figure out how to make it work with the rest of your platforms later. Um, so, uh, you know, just an example, maybe uh, registration happens in one platform, but then that information has to be pushed into another platform so you can create a list of customers. Maybe some activity happens in one platform, but then you want this activity to appear on the timeline for the contact as activity there in the CRM, in your HubSpot or whatever you're using. And maybe these two don't work. Maybe that integration is not there. You can wait for a native integration to come around and maybe it will come in a few months, maybe a few years. But even if it comes, it may not exactly be what you're looking for. So again, that's another area where you have to repeatedly do a lot of manual work, maybe pay some money for some custom integration or go to a company like Plan for help. Um, and then another case, data hygiene, DDoP, deduplication. And that's this is really big, especially in healthcare. I'm sure there are other areas where it's big, but I'll just provide my point of view. I, you know. If you think about how healthcare is organized, especially in the US, but in other countries too, you have multiple entities that relate to each other, but have very different names and different URLs. You have a university, and then you have an academic medical center, and the people that work at the university because they're teaching there are also clinicians at the academic medical center. That academic medical center is part of a healthcare system that may have different hospitals, that may have also merged over the years with another healthcare system in a different state. And there are all these different domain names that are flowing out there. And the same person, believe me or not, the same person may have two or three different email addresses in your system. And all these emails are working. Uh, and they're all receiving those emails, but there exist as different individuals in your CRM. Because one, you know, once they sign up for a webinar and they provided uh, their university email address, 
Another time they came into a trade show and they represented themselves as part of the health system. Third time they came in and talked to you about cancer, but they gave you their academic medical center or cancer centers URL. So again, how, what, how do you make sense of that? How do you automatically connect the dots? That's like something that everyone on my team is very much uh, aware of, and we are all trying to find a solution to that. Um, so I hope I kind of covered your question well, Chris, but that's, these are some of the repeatable tasks. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, it's funny, as you mentioned it, you know, I'm a marketing person, right? And um, and I've been seeing some of these same challenges, right? Uh, the the traditional hat that we wore, you know, 15, 20 years ago as marketing, you know, being concerned with lead generation, but also the aesthetics and, and the story that we tell um, are still important, but we also have to be analytical more than ever. And frankly, we have to wear a technologist hat. I feel like the responsibilities of IT have been bleeding over into the various different departments, whether I'm in HR or marketing or even finance. I have a tech stack today that I have to manage and make sense of. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, and those are interesting use cases. You know, right now, today, we are on a Zoom webinar. Um, the registration happened through HubSpot and promotion through HubSpot. We have a third party um, service, a database as a service that we use called Revenue Base, who provides us with some access to you know, con contacts. And we have to integrate them all. And frankly, some of those things do happen out of the box, right? But it's not across the board, which is, I think, some of the things that you said. Sure, you know, HubSpot might have an integration for that, or some other third party might have something that's coming down the line, but it's not available today. And you know, we're, we're not in the business of, of being able to, to wait around. Um, so I wanted to get your sense on, so you've got some of these challenges. What was the first, you know, you know, you, you, you've, I think, met uh, Vess previous to this interaction. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but what was it that brought you to plan? What was the first sort of use case that you looked to address with us? Yeah, um, yeah, I've known, I've known Vess uh, from previous uh, relationships and, you know, this is not the first time uh, I, we come across and, you know, even when I first reached out to plan, it was not the first time uh, we've talked, but, uh, you know, just one thing that I should mention about myself is that in general, I'm always curious about learning about any new platform that may eventually at one point in the future help me do my job better, whether it's marketing or sales or whatever it is. Yeah. So I don't know, from small web widgets to services, digital services to full-blown platforms, I see something that captures my attention. I don't know what to do with it now, but I do a little research. I jot down a few bullet points in my OneNote app and I move on, but I've saved it. And when the right time comes, I look in my files, it's like my Rolodex of like Ideas. solutions. And I'm like, yeah. okay, maybe it's time to check this out. So this it was also kind of what happened with, I mean, I knew on the high level what Plant was doing. It was on my OneNote. And, you know, I just, uh, when the right came, when the right time came, I just basically, you know, decided to give it a shot and to, to, to find out more about it. But, you know, specifically what was the issue? Uh, so about 18 months ago, um, we were contemplating a project where uh, we needed to make it easier for our sales reps and our finance folks to exchange information about specific sales deals. Okay. And the idea we were contemplating kind of included this uh, kind of weird combination of um, activity that had to pass and the data had to pass through several platforms. Most importantly, we had HubSpot, which was our primary CRM and also our main sales and marketing automation. Yes. But we also had ConnectWise, which is a legacy system. We acquired a company and they were using that. And a lot of the contracts and some of the information that our finance folks were using and were used to find there was in ConnectWise. So we needed to find a way to flow, like to have that information kind of pass from one place to the other easily. Um, we were working with non-technical people. Obviously, we didn't want to provide a course in HubSpot or ConnectWise to our finance and our sales folks. And a lot of that involved some custom properties and things like that, that sometimes you have to dig in, you know, HubSpot is great, but it, because it gives you so much flexibility, sometimes you need to know where to look. You yeah. need to go peel the onion and go several layers deep to find those properties. So we wanted to avoid that. 
and we wanted to make the inputs of the data easy. So we wanted to make it like a web form. You go in, you ent we ask you a few questions, you enter the information we need from you about any of these deals and, and everything else happens behind the scenes. Um, so the problem was that HubSpot's native forms, which are great for many other reasons, do not manipulate deal level data. Um, they, they capture data on the contact level. They can't do anything on the deal side. Um, so we had to use something else. And we had the experience with JotForm as another platform for building forms. So we want to use that. And on top of that, just the feature set of the native integration between HubSpot and ConnectWise was more limited than what we wanted, kind of going back to what Chris was saying that, you know, sometimes there are some, um, you know, native integrations, but they're not exactly doing what we wanted them to do. So all these things together just made it the perfect, uh, you know, reason for us to reach out to client and to see if this may be something that uh, they can help with. And ironically, that project on its own did not uh, become a reality, but that's not because <laughs> of client's capabilities. It was just that we did some rethinking on our end and basically decided to simplify the whole process. We kind of got rid of the need to integrate CupSpot to ConnectWise. So, it was, you know, I always think I used to be a consultant. So people process technology, there are three things that you can address. And in this case, we address the people in the process and not so much the technology, but that still left, a, left us with enough information about plant and the relationship. And we uh, found other reasons to use it. So other use cases. Uh, yeah. So we're still doing some pretty cool things. But what I just described here was the initial, the, the, the primary reason why we first came. Well, so it's not all a sad story. You're still here today talking about clients. So you've gotten some value out of it. Um, tell me, okay, so, you know, we're about half an hour in, so I want to keep keep the pace moving. But um, tell me, so you had an initial foray. You probably talked to Vess and the team. Um, you explored that. And then you said, you know, there's some other areas. What what was the the first um, the first use case that, you, that we brought into production together? What was the challenge? Yeah. And, and what are some of the, the results of that? Yeah, so the the first use case relates to one of the repeatable areas that I mentioned earlier, the reporting part and the forecasting on the sales side. So as much as I love HubSpot, um, uh, its native reporting capabilities are fairly limited. I mean, it's okay to just run, I mean, you can create dashboards. On each dashboard, you can have reports, but those reports are each dedicated to a single more or less variable. So you can report on one thing. Say you want to show how many deals you have at different sales stages. Great. I mean, you can easily have a chart about that. So this works pretty well for a sales manager or an ops uh, sales ops person on a daily basis, but definitely not if you're trying to create a more strategic view, especially if you start going into forecasting um, that uh, will be presented to the CEO, the, the CFO, or even later on to the board of directors in some sort of a um, uh, simplified report. What the execs really want from you, they're busy. They don't have time to spend in HubSpot. They don't have time to dig into these uh, charts and like slice and dice data on their own. They want to see everything in one place, nicely formatted, preferably for some sort of a printing, uh, like to be printed on a piece of paper so they can take it on Friday, go home, read it over the weekends, make some notes, uh, and then on Monday morning, when you have your sales calls, ask the right questions, understand what's going on with the business, uh, provide their uh, you know, uh, suggestions or whatever they can help with, and then move on. And that's just not happening uh, in an easy way in, uh, in HubSpot. You can't just get all this information in one place. Think about having to show in a nice format the the deals broken out by a sales rep, but then broken out by the different products that you have, and then uh, the stages in which they are, and how many days, uh, basically the velocity of the progression of these deals, and when the revenue is going to kick in, which month is going to kick in, all of this in one place, pretty hard to do through native reporting. So we needed to find a way to export the data. and. You know, our first choice was, okay, well, just export the huge raw file and spend a few hours formatting it. Yeah. It works, but it takes time. Um, and it's kind of a, an orchestrated thing where once there is a, if there is a exception to the rule and you're not doing this on Friday, because typically you dedicate some time to do this on Friday, let's say your CEO calls you on Wednesday and says, hey, I need it now. All right, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Uh, yeah. And it just, 
breaks the, the cycle. And then what happens while you're exporting this data and manipulating it, everyone else has to stop entering information in Hasfeld because all this will be lost from that particular batch of the reporting, right? So just not an optimal solution. It takes a lot of time. It's not great. And another choice that we entertained was, all right, so there are some, you know, you go to Hubs one thing that's good about HubSpot, it has its marketplace. You go there, you, you find some solutions, some little apps that you can download to help you with some of these needs. So there are some apps that allow you, uh, their services more, but they call them apps, but uh, they allow you to synchronize data between HubSpot and Excel. Uh, the problem is that that is still a pretty complex. Uh, you download it, and there's a learning curve. And uh, it's not very intuitive in terms of how you map the different fields. And and then it resides on your whatever. I mean, unless you want to have multiple licenses, which kind of builds the cost pretty quickly, yeah. it stays on your computer, whomever is the dedicated person to run that uh, sync uh, pool every time. And it's prone to breaking. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work very well. And then you have to build all kinds of macros on top of that uh, so that the formatting takes place, unless you still want to spend hours and hours formatting. So again, not necessarily the best thing to do. So that leads us with the third choice, which is basically what we did with uh, plans. Uh, you sign up for, uh, for that solution, and then you add your API keys. And again, I'm oversimplifying things here, right? But then you visually start setting up the links and formulas and actions between the various properties in HubSpot yep. and the target fields in your spreadsheet. And, and then you work with your IT folks to just secure an FTP site where this report can be exported. And then you designate a few members of your team or maybe someone on the finance side and someone on your, or on your side. And they can go in at any point of time, click a button, run the reports, take a few minutes for the report to upload, then download that file, and it's all there in one place. It's secure. It, it's accessible only by us because it's on a secure FTP. And it, uh, it's, uh, it's exactly formatted uh, to a point where you can just press, press print after that and distribute the hard copies if you have to. So if your CEO or CFO call you at 3.30 in the afternoon, by 3.40, you probably have something to show, to show them. And that's great. Um, so this is a great use for us, and 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 now a process that used to take us hours and hours uh, is compressed into ten minutes. And more importantly, IT is happy because it's secure. Um, we you know we engage them at the right time. Um, uh, the data is securely stored, but also we did it on our own. We didn't have to go and break their own whatever they had on their project roadmap uh, and ask them to dedicate time to help us. We we managed to to deal with it mostly on our own. So that's that's I guess one of the use cases we have. That's interesting, and I think that what's what's compelling to me is the time savings, right? Like you, you know, you explored some options. You knew that you could do it manually. You could probably do it somewhat out of the box, but your executives had specific asks that you needed to answer for, and so you were able to find a solution uh, that brought that time down from hours to minutes, which I think is compelling. Um, yep. Any other sort of results that you, you see from that or any other solutions that you've adopted with Plyant? I mean, yeah, yeah, there's another use case that, and again, I alluded earlier when we were talking about the repeatable tasks. So, you know, I was describing the issue of having multiple platforms mm -hmm. that you may have selected because they're best in class for your needs. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. Uh, but somehow, one of these platforms maybe doesn't work. It doesn't re um, talk nicely to another platform. It doesn't exchange data at all. Um, so we had this issue here. And again, what was our, I mean, just to kind of provide a little bit more background, we got a little bit too ambitious um, at our company, my team. And we were doing kind of webinars similar to what we have right now. And we call them fireside chats. And we wanted to make them more interactive, we wanted to increase the production value of them. We wanted to really be the best in our industry in terms of the experiences we provide. Um, so anything that we looked at from the off the shelf uh, point of view, Zoom webinars, it's great that we're using it now, but it's kind of like a glorified web conference uh, in yeah. a way. And then on the other hand, you have some more uh, specialized solutions like ON24, really great, but Pretty expensive. Costly. Yeah, exactly. very costly. Very expensive. So we looked at 
what we have and we decided let's concoct our own solution let's just for the fun of it let's do it and we used our regular hubspot landing pages to promote and get people to register just like you yeah. you did uh we picked our own studio software called Streamyard. so basically now we can have professional layouts uh, okay. place the speakers on the screen as we wish, uh, put little banners uh, or chirons like on TV with the question as being discussed, any other visual prompts we want to prop in, and we can fully control the branding yeah. of that. And then we link that studio stream to our preferred video platform, Vimeo, and we embed it on a landing page. And then we found this WordPress plugin that specifically does a lot of work on the webinar side so it ensures that the right people can log in only the right people can log into the webinar you have full control who has access to it and you see all kinds of analytics who's how many minutes they've stayed what they've done etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's all great i mean we were able to put it all in one place but we had one issue one snag and 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 as we roll out rolled out that webinar press uh plugin if that's what it's called okay um it turned out that it doesn't work with HubSpot. It does not communicate. Uh, even though HubSpot has really good integrations with webinar, uh, with, with WordPress, I'm sorry, not with webinar press per se. Uh, and it's not clear. Even when we looked at it, it wasn't clear from the beginning. So now we have 90% of what we wanted to accomplish. And the last 10%, we're just stuck there. Um, so this is where Plant came in and helped us because they just built a very elegant solution when once we created this template, we could rinse and repeat across all the different uh, webinars we were running, even at the same time, multiple yeah. webinars that may be overlapping in, in time. Uh, but we could take the final box in what we wanted to do. We could get the people that were registering through our HubSpot uh, landing pages seamlessly into webinar press so that everything that happens on the back end in terms of registrations and allowing people to log in and tracking who they are and what they do with your webinar, that all synced the way we want it. Uh, so it's working pretty nice for us. And that's another area that uh, we've implemented in the past uh, few months. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope that makes sense. That does make sense. I mean, it's, it sounds like, you know, you've got a lot going on and then you decided to make even more work for yourself, right? By creating <laughs> this platform, but I get it, you know, sometimes off the shelf products and capabilities are okay, but you yeah. just want them to be that much better. Um, and so I'm glad that client was was sort of able to to assist you. Do you think that you would have been able to get that 10% done in another way, or was that sort of a something that you really needed help with? Uh, I mean, we could have obviously, you know, we could have found some other ways of doing it. It probably would have taken us more time and yeah. probably more, would have cost us more money because once we have the relationship with plant, obviously, there's a you know there's scale to that that helps us um i mean what i would say is i mean and obviously you could do it also manually right i mean you could basically register people until a specific kind of time and then export that huge file and import it in webinar press and say now i'm opening the gates and letting people come in but before that there's no webinar press doesn't know who's registered yeah i mean there are different ways of doing it None of we them just thought optimal, right? You're, yeah, they're not you're optimal. We were like, we went all the hassle that we did to just create a platform that we dreamt up. And this is the one thing that's going to stop us. We just didn't want to stop there. So, OK, well, that's helpful. OK, so we've learned about you know what led you here. We learned about some of the, the solutions that you've, you've embraced together with client. Um, what's next? Do you see any other uh, opportunities on the horizon? Yeah, there's always. <laughs> there's as much that you could automate as you physically can i mean like at one point we just don't have don't have the bandwidth on our end um there are multiple things that we have on the back burner uh, that ideally we'd like to address and some of them could be very well addressed by client um, some things that we've already started thinking about for example the ddop issue that i mentioned earlier yeah. so if you remember you have multiple entries for the same contact because they have different affiliations with different organizations and different email addresses. Um, so what if we use plan to create a map where we associate all the URLs and the email domains uh, to like a, basically this is the parent organization and everything gets mapped to that. Um, and then there's another uh, parent organization and everything, all these other URLs that we are aware of kind of relate to that. 
and uh, and then we create an automation that um, you know for some more straightforward connections it's pretty easy. It's a no brainer that this person belongs to this um, you know hospital and this hospital is part of this uh, healthcare system. So maybe we just merge them automatically. For others, maybe there's a little bit of a human input that needs to be uh, like some uh, you know object uh, subjective thinking that needs to be applied. So you can push it into some sort of a dashboard and someone can review these on a regular basis, but at least they don't have to find them on their own. Yeah. And it's all in one place and you just basically click and decide, <coughs> excuse me, which ones you want to automate, uh, to do up automatically. So um, that's what we're thinking about right now. We haven't really done it yet, but um, it's a good candidate for automation that can be done through a platform like yours. And, you know, going back to, native solutions HubSpot recently released something that has the promise to do that but it costs a thousand dollars a month yeah <laughs> and i'm still not 100 percent certain if it's really going to help with that so um you know just some things we're you know reviewing at the moment okay another okay. another potential use case uh i mean it kind of relates to getting people to, when they sign up on your, again, think about a marketer. Like for those of you that are not marketers, you go to a website, what's the, our primary goal for us as a marketer is to get you to raise your hand and ask to speak with us. And there's all these contact forms that are in different places trying to capture the information from you. Now, in theory, if I just ask you to provide me, to tell me that you're interested in me and give me your contact information, that's useful for me, that's, that's a win. But then someone on my end, maybe my sales development rep or even the sales rep can has to go back to you and have some back and forth to schedule a time when we can actually have this meeting. And sometimes what happens is things break down during this time and we lose you as a lead. Yep. So it's much better if I can just have you to not only when you fill out that form, not only give me information about yourself, but you pick the date and time and we automatically add it to your uh, calendar, but it goes on the calendar of the right salesperson. And there's a Zoom meeting set up or a Teams, Microsoft Teams, whatever it's being used, and it's all done. And you know the chances of this becoming a real conversation and actually progressing as a sales deal increase. Now, HubSpot has, and some other solutions have this really good uh, thing that uh, they allow they, each sales rep and including myself, I can have my own marketing link uh, that is like an online booking link and I can share it with everyone. And it shows like a nice visual way for people to see my publicly available calendar and pick a date and time that works for them and then set up a call with me. That's all great. One thing that for some reason is overlooked by all these solutions is how do you build logic behind it? Because in the real world, um, there is sales teams and these sales teams are aligned with territory. If you're big enough and you're, if you're focusing on the US, you probably have some territories, at least at a minimum, you have East Coast, West Coast and Central States. Maybe you have Canada, someone else in Canada responsible for that. Maybe even break it down into smaller uh, or maybe large companies or just smaller companies, type of company. Uh, there are different, or if you're international, it becomes even more segmented, right? So you have to have that logic so that when someone is filling out the form, when you find out demographically where they are, who they are, or firmographically, which company they represent, then after that, you provide them with the calendar of the right person. And uh, the only solution that we've seen so far that kind of does this off the, uh, the box, out of directly you buy them and they uh, offer this logic is called Chili Piper. We use them for a while but it's pretty kludgy and it still takes 20, 30 seconds between you entering the demographic and firmographic information and then seeing a calendar. 20 seconds, 30 seconds, that's eons in marketing speak. Like and you've during this time, people are going to drop off. Right, you've What's already that? paid for HubSpot. So Chili Piper is yet another cost. Just another, yeah, yeah, and it's not cheap. It's not yeah. cheap. Uh, <laughs> and it's not working the way we want. So maybe maybe Plant can can help us with that. Maybe we can leverage this and maybe creates a little bit of JavaScript code that is sent to client workflow as input variables. It determines who, based on the prospect's location, which calendars needs to be popped up and that calendar gets popped up inside the actual form as people are filling out that form. Um, so again, something we're looking at, um, 
you know, I'm sure at one point when we have the bandwidth, we'll get a little more serious about it. But like I said, there's so many different areas that could be automated. It's just a question of finding the time to work on them. Well, we'll have our customer success folks get in touch with you. And, and as thanks for this, we'll make sure that we make it happen. Um, we've got just a few questions and I'm sensitive to time, so we'll have to wrap up relatively soon, but I think we can get through one or two of them. Um, Vess, you're there. Uh, I do want to give you the opportunity to provide some context, but before, um, one of these questions that came in, so uh, it talks to the fact that, you know, uh, Plant is an automation solution, right? Um, but there are other automation solutions out there. Zapier, for one, is one of them. <clears throat> How is Plant different, um, in your words, from something that's sort of uh, uh, in, in the area of Zapier? So... Zapier is a great solution. It addresses a huge number of use cases and it does it well. It does out of the box. So um, very, very impressive platform. Now, what Zapier does is this one-to-one -one integration. It solves a very specific use case, um, whether it's merging a spreadsheet into HubSpot, et cetera. Yes, it does it, it, does it very well. Where Zapier, um, where Pliant comes in and can help folks who are already familiar with Zapier, already have invested in automation mindset, it's creating more complex uh, solutions. Some of the things that Emil mentioned include quite a bit of business logic embedded inside the plant workflow. Oftentimes, you also need to interact with multiple platforms. It's one-to-one -one is not good enough. You need to have you know, the content coming in through a form in HubSpot, creating a webinar link, maybe also updating uh, another third-party service like your um, the, 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 uh, the forum page that Emil was referring to. <laughs> I'm Top form. Yes, so uh, getting all these things in under a single hood is certainly a, a challenge with a platform like Zapier, right? Which is very good at this one-to-one, -one, like really quick links. But the moment you sort of start um, evolving your operations the moment you start looking beyond uh, a simple office level automation, that's where a platform like Plant really comes in and helps folks who, again, have already invested, already think of automation as a must-have day one requirement. Um, secondarily, one thing that Plant offers that's extremely unique in the industry is a 15 business day certification for new APIs. So if you come to us, if you want to integrate with an API that we may not be familiar with. I mean, certainly when Emil came to us and was looking at uh, webinar press, that was not something that we had under our hood. Um, you know, it's a plugin, works well in his use case, but that's something that our engineers turn around as a part of your um, subscription within 15 business days. And that's an SLA that's inside our contracts. So that's not... Um, something that, you know, we, once we sign you up as a customer, that's something you get. So uh, that's very unique in the industry. It gives you the power to innovate, think out of the box, find, like, as Emil was mentioning, the best of class solution for what you need and never be constrained by your automation platform in what you can imagine, right? So uh, that's a really powerful part of the client um, experience. I mean, obviously, we try to be extremely white glove. Uh, we try to help our customers think with them through the use cases they bring to us uh, across a number of industries, um, which is, again, sort of a differentiator. Again, you know, some things like Zapier, again, very easy to use, very nice. You're not going to necessarily have an SE on the phone with you for the next hour talking to you through your particular use case. This is something that Blind certainly brings to the table. Excellent. That's great. Um, the last question uh, that I have here, that you actually answered the one about the, the industries, who, who does it serve, right? Um, but the question was about community edition. So I, I alluded to community mm. edition earlier. I'll pull the slide back up because I do have a call to action. I want to share that out and it's the link to where to go. But the question was, can I download community edition today? And so I think there's kind of two questions in there. I wouldn't mind if you take them. So yeah, community edition is a cloud-based product. So you're not going to download for it. Download it. You will sign up for it. And yes, it is available. <clears throat> I invite anyone uh, watching us to go in and so hit the link that Chris is sharing. Um, it's really easy to sign up. We have uh, spent a lot of effort. We're actually just coming out of beta right now to make the onboarding experience as easy as possible and sort of guide you into what uh, power of client can be. Because as I mentioned. 
a lot of our use cases tend to lean into more involved ones, right? Not so much technology being complicated, but the process itself that you're trying to automate may be complex. And oftentimes, because of this, the way to approach connecting multiple APIs may require uh, a little bit of onboarding knowledge. So we've done a lot of great work um, building those guides, sort of getting you primed, helpfully productive within 30, 40 minutes of getting on the platform. Uh, certainly encourage everyone to experiment and invite you to contact us right away if you have use cases, if you're thinking through, should I do it this way or that way? Um, we have great folks who will be able to help you and uh, guide you through building your first few integrations. Excellent. Well, thank you, Vess, for that. And uh, Emil, thank you as well for your time. Um, sure. I think you've, you, you've done some pretty cool things. As a marketer, I'm specifically <laughs> um, impressed. Uh, so I appreciate your time today, and I appreciate your being a, a client customer. Thanks to you both. Yep. And thanks, everyone, for joining.